In this video, we look at rotation operators for the rigid rotor model system. So we have our rigid rotor model system. There are two atoms. They're held together by a covalent bond of bond length L. This bond length is fixed. That is the rigid part of the rigid rotor. And these molecules are rotating around their common center of mass, the rotor part of rigid rotor. Each of them has a velocity vector, which is perpendicular to the bond. Each of them travels in a circle around their common center of mass. Their distance, they tra uh, the radius of the circle they travel is L1 and L2. I actually have these reversed because of what I've labeled these atoms. should take care of that. There we go. Okay, and our kinetic energy we get from looking at the angular uh, components of this and translating all these linear components into angular components. So the frequency of rotation is the velocity divided by how far it has to travel to get how many, unit, how many units of rotation per second. So it's v1 over 2 pi l1 circumference of this circle or v2 over 2 pi l2 circumference of this circle. All right, and then our angular velocity is 2 pi times angular frequency. Angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Moment of inertia is like the resistance to angular acceleration. It's the analog of mass for rotation. So moment of inertia is equal to our reduced mass of these two atoms times the bond length squared. And reduced mass, as we saw for harmonic oscillator, is the product of mass 1 and mass 2 divided by their sum m1 plus m2. So the kinetic energy, which equals 1 half mv squared for the whole system, equals momentum squared over 2 times mass, or in this case, translating into rotational motion, equals angular momentum squared divided by 2 times moment of inertia. And our potential energy is going to be zero for everywhere in space. The only restriction is that the center of mass and the bond length are both fixed. The molecule can rotate anywhere at once within those restrictions. All right, so in order to solve the Schrodinger equation for this system, we need to get a Hamiltonian operator for our Schrodinger equation, h psi equals e psi. So we have h equals the kinetic energy operator plus potential energy operator. So the potential is zero, so that's easy, we're done. The kinetic energy is going to be negative h bar squared over 2 times reduced mass. We're going to use the reduced mass of the system for the mass. Times the Laplacian operator, del squared. Del squared is the sum of the second partial derivative with respect to x, y, and z. All right, so that's nice, but it really isn't convenient to solve this problem in terms of x, y, and z because of this restriction here that the bond length is constant. What it's much more convenient to do is translate x, y, z into spherical polar coordinates. If you need a refresher with spherical polar coordinates, uh, check out my math review uh, video on that topic. Okay, so when we do this in spherical polar coordinates, we go from x, y, and z to r, the radius, theta, the polar angle, and phi, the azimuthal angle. And r, the radius, is constant because our bond length is fixed. So psi is going to be a function of the two rotational angles, theta and phi. So we need to translate our Laplacian into spherical polar. So the Laplacian in spherical polar, there exists a formula for this, but it's much more long and drawn out than the nice simple formula in Cartesian. So it's this monstrosity here, which is 1 over r squared, partial with respect to r, of the, of the quantity r squared, partial with respect to r, at constant theta and phi, plus 1 over r squared, partial with respect to theta, quantity sine theta, partial with respect to theta, plus 1 over r squared, sine theta, second partial derivative with respect to phi. We can make one simplification here and that's the fact that r is a constant, so any derivatives with respect to r are going to go to zero. So lucky for us, this whole first term goes away. We can also set any time we have a constant r, we can set that value equal to l, because that's what we're using for our coordinate here. We're using mu for the reduced mass, uh, reduced mass for the mass, and we're using l for our radius. 
So the bond length goes in here. We can factor out an r squared from each term. So we have 1 over l squared times 1 over sine theta dd theta product sine theta dd theta plus 1 over sine theta second partial with respect to phi. All right, so now our Hamiltonian operator is going to be negative h bar squared over 2 mu times del squared, going to be this del squared operator. And we know this has to be equal to the angular momentum squared operator over 2 times moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia, we know, is the reduced mass times length squared. So we have the 2 mu, which we see already outside of del squared. We have the L squared, which must be somewhere inside there. And conveniently, we see in del squared there is already a 1 over L squared. So what is this angular momentum squared operator? Well, it's going to be everything that we don't see inside of here once we multiply this by, where did it go? By minus h bar squared over 2 mu. So what we have here is that L squared is going to equal minus h bar squared L squared times del squared. So our angular momentum squared operator is going to be minus h bar squared times everything inside these parentheses. That's our L squared operator. Um, also it, in, of interest to us, in, besides the total angular momentum squared, is going to be the components of the angular momentum, particularly the z component of the angular momentum. The LZ operator, for reasons I'm not going to prove, is equal to minus i h bar first derivative with respect to phi. So that's LZ. Our rigid rotor wave functions are going to be eigenfunctions of both L squared and LZ. Uh, when we get to the hydrogen atom, those wave functions as well will be eigenfunctions of L squared and LZ. They are not going to be eigenfunctions of LX or LY. Uh, they're only going to be eigenfunctions of L squared and LZ. So now we are all set up for our Schrodinger equation for H psi equals E psi. Our psi is going to be a function of theta and phi, the spherical polar coordinates for the angles at a constant uh, bond length. And our Hamiltonian is going to be negative h bar, is going to be uh, the L squared operator over 2 times reduced mass times the bond length. So we'll see you in the next video for what these energy levels end up being.